for. If you don't have your Bible with you, don't worry. Uh, we're only going to make it through a couple of books of the Bible this evening here at our, uh, our three-hour service. <laughs> Welcome to the coastlands. <laughs> that was perhaps the most nervous laughter I've heard in some time. <laughs> He's kidding, right? <laughs> yes, I'm joking. Luke chapter 4. This evening, what I want to share with you revolves around one word, and that word is behold. It's going to take me quite a few more words to expound upon the one word. might not come as a surprise to you that I need many words to expound upon one. I remember this time when I was talking to my mom on the phone, and this light bulb went on, and I said, Mom... I think I might be a verbal processor. (laughs) I thought I was going to kill my mother. She was laughing so hard. She was like choking on, you know, her laughter um, because apparently this fact was abundantly obvious to her and mysterious to me. And I was like, hold on, mom. Let me talk this out and figure out whether or not I'm a verbal processor. (laughs) I like words. But this word behold, I, I've been thinking about it for quite some time, actually. I, I read in a different book of the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, this word behold, and I just kind of became fixated on it. I began thinking about it and meditating on it, and as is my pattern, I know this is a bit unusual. I know that most people, when they're reading the Bible, don't have like a Greek concordance next to them or a Hebrew concordance and are looking up, you know, what the original language was and behold and what does that mean exactly. Um, but that's what I do. You're going to discover the depths of the nerdery that's happening up here, okay, in, in this evening, so just prepare yourself for it. I'm even going to do some math. Whoa. Did I cross a line? Well, you already came in the door. You're sitting down, so, you know. There was a mass rush to the back of people who needed to use the bathroom for a long time. Okay, um, don't worry. It's going to be, you know, Bible math. Anyway, um, So I looked up the word behold in the original Greek and the original Hebrew because this word is used both in the Old Testament Hebrew and and the New Testament Greek. And this is what it means. Uh, Behold. That's what it said in there. Those words that just mean behold, that didn't help me very much. So I had to look it up in English. Behold means it's basically an exclamation that is used to draw attention to something that you wouldn't otherwise notice. Behold. In Santa Cruz, we might say, dude, A synonym of behold is low. I have never used that in my life. What's never once have I used low, dude, low. But the idea is that in the scriptures, God is calling our attention to something that we might otherwise miss. It might seem so ordinary. There's nothing extraordinary about it that we just sort of overlook it. But as I was studying this word behold, I found out that it's used almost 1,200 times in the Bible. 1,200 verses, almost 1,200 verses, have the word behold in them. Do you know how many verses are in the Bible? You ready for this? There's a little bit over 31,000 verses in the Bible. Quick math, that's 4% of every single verse in the Bible has the word behold in it. That's one every 25 verses. Every chapter is about 26 verses. So every chapter in the Bible has the word behold in it. That was the math. You did it. You, you lasted through the math. You're fine. You did it. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Like, oh, God, what are you? I did it. I came to church my one time per year, and I lasted through some Bible math. Congratulations, everyone. Almost once a chapter, the Bible uses the word behold. Are you beholding what I'm trying to lay down right now? Are you, are you catching it? There's a lot of things that God wants to draw our attention to that we wouldn't otherwise see if he didn't draw our attention to it. In the Christmas story with Jesus, his birth, there's two behold moments that we're going to read about, um, or I'm going to tell you about, rather, in, in just a second. But I was thinking about this odd reality of the history of Jesus's life, this incredible moment that we celebrate on Christmas, Jesus coming to the earth, him being born, him being introduced into the world. And for those of us who are familiar with the scriptures, familiar with the story, what we understand is that this was the beginning of this process that ended in the salvation for the entire world. But it began in such an anticlimactic way. I mean, there were extraordinary things about it, like a woman giving birth to a child in a manger. I mean, 
that's pretty extraordinary. But as far as like, you know, the shepherds knew or the people on the surrounding inns knew, it was a night like any other night. And one of the times when this word behold is used in this story is when the angels appear to these shepherds as they were watching their flocks by night. I assume that was a normal thing. That wasn't like an extraordinary thing. They watch them by day and then lose them at night and find them again in the morning. I assume they normally watch their flocks by night. And it's just a normal night. And then this angelic host appeared to the shepherds and they said, behold, I'm gonna tell you something that tonight isn't just an ordinary night. This moment isn't like every other moment that you have experienced before this, but God has introduced salvation into the world tonight. What I'm hoping is that tonight would be a behold moment for you. There's many things that God wants to say to each and every one of us. And you might be surprised as to the kindness, as to the love, as to the purpose that is always, uh, that, that all of God's words to us are wrapped in. He has so much that he wants to say to you. And sometimes he needs to speak something like, behold, pay attention to this, because otherwise you could miss it. So I was thinking about the fact that Jesus came into the world, the beginning of salvation, as a baby. And all of the people who had no idea, because they hadn't beheld what began on that night. Bible scholars estimate about 30 some odd years later, Jesus gets up in the temple and he essentially announces to the people at that time that he was the person that they were waiting for. He was Messiah. He was the Savior. But think about that. For 30 years, this beginning of the process of salvation was in their midst the entire time, and they didn't know it, except for the people who were told, behold, something has happened. I find that to be true in my own life even now, that as I've walked with the Lord for many years, as I have heard him many times, sometimes it's hard to perceive on my own the beginning of a work of God in my life. And I need to have my attention be called to something that I wouldn't normally look at. The Bible says that God's ways just fundamentally, foundationally, at their core, are completely and utterly different than our ways. It means that our intuition, our impulses, our imaginations, our expectations are all just like off. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, in his infinite love, has been continually trying to help us behold the things that are true, the things that are true about him, the things that are true about you, the things that are true about God's plan for your life, the purpose that you have in living the life that he gave you. But sometimes, from time to time, we have behold moments when God captures our attention and we can see something, even though with like natural eyes or natural analysis, it might look like any other normal, ordinary night. Tonight does not have to be an ordinary night. Tonight doesn't even have to be an ordinary Christmas Eve. It could be an extraordinary Christmas Eve for you. Because you could hear from the creator of the universe I mean, just think about that for a second. The God that we're talking about has a well of wisdom that extends to infinity. To imagine that I am done or even close to completing what he has stored up for me, that's foolish. He has so many paths for each of us to walk on. All of these works of God that he begins in our life, just like the one when he sent Jesus as a baby, They all end in the same place. It's something the Bible calls life. Instead of death, we experience life. Instead of loss, we experience blessing. Instead of the troubles and the difficulties of the world, we experience peace. All of the pathways of God lead to life. But our own impulses, our own ways of living, they don't lead to those same places of life. They lead to death. 
God is kind of like this master, uh, trail master. <laughs> That's probably not what they call them. Master trail masters. I feel like there's a more official name for that. Um, <laughs> God is like a trail master. I went on a backpacking trip with a friend of mine one time. And uh, I, was, I was like 19 years old or something like that and, and uh, got permission for my parents to go on this backpacking trip in, in the summer. And it see, now in retrospect, I realized that my friend knew exactly what to say, I think, to get my parents to sign off on me going on this backpacking trip. And he, uh, he, he kind of fooled them a little bit, fooled me a little bit too. He's like, oh yeah, we're going to go to this place. My family goes there all the time. By all the time, he meant that he went there when he was like seven years old once. He was a little bit kind of like, we'll figure it out when we get there kind of guy, you know. We'll get a map from Trail Masters or something, and then we'll go there. And so I'm also, I had no idea. Like, you know, it was just me and him, me and my buddy. And uh, we had backpacks, and, and we, were, we were going. We are going to camp, you know, on the, live on the land and, you know, fight bears and, you know, whatever. Do whatever you do on backpacking trips. I don't know. I wasn't an expert. I was relying on him to be the expert. And he's like, oh, yeah, we're going to go to this great family spot. And I'm like, that's great. So we're walking, and... I just started to get the feeling as we were walking, it didn't really seem like he knew where we were going exactly. Like I'd ask him like, oh, is this the way? And he'd say things like, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Is this like a choose your own adventure or something? Like what, what are we talking about here? So we, we ended up in this place and he kept looking at the map and I mean, honestly, we had like one of these cartoon moments. He was like, huh? Uh, like turn the map around, like where exactly are we? I think we're here. I'm like, you think we're what? <laughs> and this is like two days into the trip. You know, we're in the middle of nowhere for all I know. And we're in the, mi we're in the middle of this huge like canyon. And, uh, and also we ran out of water because he remembered when he was seven years old, oh, this is like a lush riverside with tons of water. We'll just like, you know, purify the water with our water purifiers. I'm like, sounds great. Well, we got to the lush river and it was like a tiny little trickle, like barely on the water. It was just like skimming or skimming along the rocks. There was no like depth to the water whatsoever. So we go two days in, we have a bunch of food, fine, but we have no water. I'm like, dude, low. <laughs> Behold. <laughs> I don't think you know where we are. <laughs> and he's like, no, okay, so we figured it out. And then we kept looking on the map, like, where's the next water source? And we found a water source up the mountain because we're in this huge canyon, right? So we climbed, we kind of looked and like, oh, no, we, we need ropes there. And now oh, we need ropes over there too. And that looks climbable. Well, the reason it looked climbable is because a fire had recently gone through that place. And so it was a little bit kind of like, you know, uh, a little bit of a graded slope, if you will. So we start climbing up there. No water, okay? No water. And I'm climbing like ash, like hand over feet ash because it was so steep. I don't know what it is about mountains. They look a lot shallower until you get on them. <laughs> and then I'm like... You know, it was like definitely the point of no return. Like, this is happening. You can't go down. I'm not going to slide ash all the way down there. So I climb all the way up. I was wearing sunglasses and what was a white t-shirt. Um, and I was just like covered in soot. I climbed all the way up there. Long story short, I got like altitude sickness or something. So I like yacked all over the place. And then we found our water source. <laughs> and the water source was one inch deep. Like the size of this room, one inch deep. And it was like algae everywhere. So we went over and we like slowly, you know, <laughs> and we stuck our little water purifier thing in and it felt like it took like hours to pump enough water to just get like a sip, you know, like, oh, these dry lips, you know, oh, to get a sip. And then we turned around and went home. <laughs> anyway, life in God's not like that is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> the analogy is breaking down. Move on to the next point. The point is that God has paths for us to walk on. And at times it might seem like, is this really a path? Or are you just kind of making this up as we're going along? But it's because he knows the contours of life. And he knows how to get you from where you are to the life that he intended for you to live. And the truth is, you don't. 
God sent Jesus so we could behold what God is like, so that we could behold what living for God is like. That is the gift that he gave us in Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, I'm going to read the the text here. This is a moment, not Jesus' birth, but much later when he announces his public ministry. He describes some of the things, some of the works of God that he came to do. And what my hope is, is that this evening, when we read about the kinds of things that Jesus came to do, that you would recognize that he's not done. He still wants to do these kinds of things in your life. And that you, knowing the kinds of things that he wants to do, you might be able to recognize the beginnings, like the infant stages of what God is beginning in your life. And you might not realize that he's actually speaking something to you, but you didn't recognize his voice. When you don't even know what to look for, it's really hard to find that thing. You know what I'm talking about? Even when I know what to look for, the fridge is like a black hole, basically. I cannot find things. You know, I'm looking for salsa. I know exactly what it looks like. It's red or it's green, or it used to be red and now it's green. Those things you throw away. (laughs) And I can't find it. And even my wife says, like, it's on the top shelf to the right. You know, I'm on top shelf to the right. I can't see it. Oh, well, it was behind something. You didn't say that. Even when you know what the thing looks like that you're looking for, it can be hard to find. When you don't even know what the work of God looks like in your life, that's really hard to find that. But that's why the scriptures are so helpful for us because it describes the kinds of things that we would be experiencing. And my hope is that this evening you would behold a word of God in your life. That might be like the beginning of this new path that he wants you to walk on. It's hard to perceive on your own, but hear the words of the scriptures, and let's see if we can't find something for you. Luke chapter 4, verse 16, I'm going to read through verse 21. Jesus came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are downtrodden and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I find it interesting that Jesus didn't say, today the scripture has begun to be fulfilled in your hearing. Because you remember, he came 30 years prior to that. I want to go through this list of things. Jesus is quoting one of the Old Testament scriptures, Old Testament books, the book of Isaiah, where there was this prophecy about the Messiah that would come and the kinds of things that the Savior would do in the world. And Jesus is saying, I came to do these things because I am Messiah. But I want to go through this list, and I want to analyze some of the words here and explain the kinds of things that you might be feeling in your heart that could be a sign that God is wanting to do something in your life in this area. And what might it look like, the beginning, the infant stage, the very first introduction of that kind of work in God in your life, what might it look like so that you could behold it if that's what's happening in your heart? So the first thing that he says is the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Back in that book in Isaiah, instead of the word poor, it uses the word afflicted. Jesus isn't necessarily making an economic statement here that he just came to preach good news to folks who are struggling economically. But what he was saying is that for those of you who have been flattened by Uh, the difficult circumstances in your life. The idea of being afflicted is kind of like you got taken out at the knees. 
Like someone came up from behind you, you weren't expecting it, and you just got whacked in the back of the knees, and you just kind of lost your footing, and you fell down flat on your back. That's the idea of being poor, being afflicted. It's kind of the idea of loss. Instead of what you were meant to have, you are left wanting. You are left with, with less. And what Jesus is saying is that he came to bring really good news to people who have experienced loss in their life, who are poor of spirit, poor of circumstance, poor of family, poor of resource, whatever it might be, that God has come to bring good news to those people. What it might look like in your life if God is wanting to do something in that area of your life is you might have become recently more aware of how poor your life really is. You see, because the beginning of that work is even just recognizing I am poor. And the kind of recognition that I'm talking about is I have so much loss in my life, I can't overcome it. I don't have hope to regain what has been taken from me. That's the kind of loss that I'm talking about. And folks, I wish, I wish for your sake and for my sake that it didn't take such a difficult recognition of where we are in life without God to bring us to a place where we know that we need him. But the good news is that those places where you recognize I can't regain what I have lost is exactly the place where God says, I've come to give you those things for free. Good news. Second thing he says here is he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Release, it kind of just means freedom, captive. It, it means that there's been something in your life that has bound you up. It has hemmed you in. It's, it's kept you really small. Or maybe something that has attached itself to you, like a depression or a sense of shame that just keeps you living in such a tiny little place, whereas God made you to live in such a wide open place. And God has come to proclaim a release from those things. It's like something you can't get away from. The faithful friend of betrayal that just follows you everywhere. God has come to proclaim release between you and the things that are on you that were never meant to be on you. Maybe it's a sense of responsibility for something that really isn't your responsibility. God has come to separate you from those things that aren't yours to be attached to. Being a captive is, is, is kind of the idea that it wasn't exactly your fault. Maybe something has happened to you because of life circumstance, the brokenness of the world, or maybe somebody else's poor choice and has left you in a place that's really small. But Jesus came to proclaim release to you. What the beginning stage of the work of God might look like in your life in that area could be just a hope that he really could separate you from this thing that you've been struggling with for so long. A hope that something might change even though nothing has. That could be the very beginning of the whisper of the work of God. That first step on the path that leads towards freedom. The third thing that he says is recovery of sight to the blind. Maybe you're experiencing a genuine desire to want to know God. Maybe you're not even sure if he exists. Maybe you're not sure if he really is loving. Maybe there's something going on in your life that you don't understand. But experiencing a fresh wave of a genuine desire, oh God, I want to know. I know that I don't, but show me what I can understand about this. Show me who you are. Reveal yourself to me, God. I want to know that you're real. God will reveal himself to you. Follow that desire. Follow it through. Because that could be the beginning of what God is doing in your life. The fourth thing that he says is to set free those who are downtrodden. In the book of Isaiah, it uses the word prisoner. This is perhaps the deepest truth of all. That those things that have happened in our lives because we made wrong choices. The prisoner is there because of guilt. That there are things that we have done in our lives that are not right. 
and maybe the reason why we're downtrodden, maybe the reason why we are in prison is because we deserve those things. We deserve the consequence of the things that we are experiencing. But Jesus came to set you free even from the guilt of what you have done that was wrong. That's why he gave his life so that you wouldn't have to give yours. You wouldn't have to live out your sentence in prison. You wouldn't have to stay there. But that he flung those prison doors wide open, saying you can go out from this place. The debt has been paid. I love this word downtrodden. It means crushed. Like you're just smashed, crushed in your life. No hope, no structural integrity to how you're living your life. But God has come to restore those things. There might be something going on in your life, a pattern of sin, something you know is wrong, or maybe something that you suspect is wrong. And you might be experiencing a recent desire to want to just finally kick that addiction, to not go to that place anymore, to not react that way anymore. Friends, behold the word of God. He's trying to say something to you. He's trying to speak something to you. He's trying to begin something in you. Behold it. Just now the worship team is going to play a song for us. Can you guess the title of the song? Behold. Behold, it is behold, lo. Um, I just want to ask you to do something. As you're sitting there and you're enjoying the music, we're not trying to put on a concert for you. Uh, the fog machines broke before service anyway, so too bad about that. Um, we're, we're not trying to entertain you this evening. What we're wanting to do is to usher in an atmosphere, an environment, a moment, a place where you could hear from God. What I want to ask you to do as you're listening to this song, Behold, is that if you want to behold a fresh word of God in your life, whether this is the very first time you've ever tried to hear from God, or this is the 767th time that you've heard from the Lord, if you want to behold a new thing from Him, behold a new word from Him, just tell Him. God, I want to see where I don't see. Can you show me where in the ordinary course of my life you are wanting to show me something extraordinary? I need to see it because I can't see it on my own. And just, as the song is playing, just listen for any small little whisper of what a loving God, the one who created you, your Father in heaven, would want to say to you. It won't be probably how you might imagine it would. Just like everybody in that Christmas story thought Jesus was going to come in strength and might and power with a bang, in shock and awe. But the beginning of the word of God often is just in a simple whisper. So we're going to give you that moment right now to engage in that, to hear from God and to behold something new. And then I'm going to come up and wrap up the service. You can close your eyes if you want to or just listen to the song. But hear from your God.
talked about these paths that God has for us in our lives. <clears throat> the destination of the first path has a name. It's called salvation. We call it salvation because we need to be saved. We call it rescue because the things that have happened in our lives, because of the wrong things that we have done, have eternal consequences. But Jesus came so that you could be saved from the world, yes, from others, possibly, but mostly he came to save you from the wrongness that's in your life, to cleanse you completely. He has a purpose for you. He has more paths than just salvation for you. But it begins with that most ever important one to say, yes, Lord, I receive. I want to be forgiven. I want to be clean. I want to be guilt-free. So I want to ask you if you'd close your eyes with me here. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask if you're here this evening, maybe you weren't expecting it. Maybe you thought tonight was going to be an ordinary night. I want to ask if there's anyone here who has never accepted the cleansing forgiveness of this loving God in your life. And you're having a behold moment right now when you're seeing God in a way that you never have seen him before. And you're realizing that this whole story is, it's not a fantasy, it's real. And that there's this God who loves me so much that he would give his life for me. Even knowing the things that you've done wrong, even knowing the things that you're going to do wrong, he sent Jesus anyway to take on his person all of the consequence of our sin. If that's you this evening, again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you look up at me and even signal me with your hand to say, Evan, I, I want to receive Jesus and his forgiveness in my life for the first time. Any this evening? Jesus is calling out to you. He's beckoning you to behold him as he is a God of love, a God of forgiveness. I want to ask a second group of people. If you're here this evening and you feel like God has a new path for me to walk on, and I'm beholding something that I didn't expect, a path of freedom, a, pl a path of having my eyes be opened, a new path that I know God is wanting me to walk in. Maybe you've known the Lord for many years, but he's calling you to a path of righteousness, a path of purity. And this evening you want to acknowledge that, that you have beheld him, and you just want to make a statement to say, I have seen God and I want to follow this path that he's laying out for me. If you'd look up at me even now and just signal me with your hand so that I could say amen to you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of people. Lots of beholding God. Amen. Let it be. Lord, I thank you that until this time, when we all get to behold you face to face, to see you glorified in the way that you truly are, thank you that you give us these revelations so that we can see bits and pieces of who you are and your plans for our lives. Lord, I pray for those who acknowledge that they're seeing something new from you that they hadn't seen before. God, give them a courage to continually to take steps on that path, to not hold back, but to step forward and arrive at the destination wherever it is that you have for them, Lord. Thank you that you are revealing yourself to us bit by bit, from glory to glory, Lord. We love you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, that's it.